Welcome to the Healthcare Unfiltered Express, where I conduct short video interviews packed with relevant and timely information that you cannot miss. So sit back and enjoy the show. My dear friend and colleague, Dr. Julio Chavez on Healthcare Unfiltered Express. It's been a while. I was just telling Julio that the last, I mean, the, the guy doesn't age. I mean, you're like the same guy I've known, like, I swear to God, for 20 years. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charlie, for having me. Um, yeah, I remember um, when I met you the first time, I think in, in person, <laughs> I think it was in Seattle. We have the Double Hidden Lymphoma Consortium. It was a while back. It was a while back, and uh, you know, I think kind of like a start of our relationship. You know, um, you actually reached out to me to do this kind of like a double healing from a project, and and it was published in, uh, in yeah. Lord, I believe, and that was kind of like a, my start of my career in informa in a way. So, well, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. It's we're not going to tell people how long we've known each other because this will give away our age. But Julio, <laughs> by the way, Julio currently is at the Mayo Clinic. I've known him since he was at Moffitt, and. Um, and congratulations on your new post. Um, but we're going to talk about cell mods today yeah. because there's a lot of questions about what are cell mods, what are their, you know, do they work, not work, what's their position in lymphoid malignancies, and so on. So let's start by just ex- you explaining to us what are cell mods. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Um, you know, I understand that there is a lot of confusion because it, it seems that they have the same mechanism of action, if you kind of read quickly. Uh, but I can tell you they're very exciting drugs because uh, I can tell you a little bit of my story with the kind of immunomodulators and cell mods. So actually, uh, EMIT was my first uh, clinical trials at junior faculty. So it's kind of like a close to 15 years when we started the studies with you know, abadomide, for instance, was a drug that was kind of like, you know, very known, but, uh, you know, we have trials that don't enroll a lot of patients. And so what are cell mods? So the cell mods stands for cerebral e ligase modulators, so immune modulators. And how those are oral drugs, small oral drugs that are usually given in a, in a kind of like a time limited fashion, similar to other emits, like, for instance, lenalumide that we use for myeloma and lymphomas. We give three, you know, three weeks in a row, one week off. It's kind of like the same, but less time. Like, you know, we, the, the cell models that we use for lymphomas, we use it either for one week or two weeks, and then the rest of the time off for every cycle. So it, how is different from imits, you know, immunomodulators like talilomide, lenalilomide, or pomalilomide? They both target the same, the same uh, target, you know, for example, if the, the cerebrum but they target in a different way. So one of the properties of the cell mods are different of, of image is that kind of like they change a little bit the, com, uh, the conformational um, structure of the cerebrum in a way that they, they make more sensitive to the E ligase, to the transcription factors. Like e, the most important transcription factors are Icarus and Iolos. So they're very tied to the cerebrum. So that when you block the cerebrum, they kind of like a change the conformational structure is more compact. So it makes more sensitive to uh, the proteasome to degrade those proteins, the transcription factors like Icarus and Iolos. So len, lenalidomide and pomalidomide, they do the same, but they don't kind of change much this conformational structure of the cerebrum. And when you have like a, what we call like an open structure, you know, it's kind of like an open chromatin, chromatin they're more susceptible to mutations, to resistance to mutations in the cerebrum. So, for instance, patients who had had, uh, had uh, cerebral mutations, they could be sensitive still to cell mods, but not for the init. So, I see. They, so, so they they kind of work. Uh, they have the same target, but the way they affect the cerebrum is different. Like, uh, is different. Yeah. and also higher affinity. You know, for instance, the affinity of lenalidomide to cerebrum is about 25 percent. Yeah. For iberomide, which is another cell mode, it's about 60%. And for volcadomide, it's about 80% or, or close to actually 100%. Got so it's that, that too, that kind of uh, the potency that they have for higher binding and efficacy too. And we saw that clinically, actually. Yeah, that's very, very helpful explanation. Thank you, Julio. So 
we've, we, we, we are learning that there are a lot of ongoing investigations, a lot of interest in how cell mods work in lymphoid malignancies. What's happening there? What are the studies, uh, any data you could share with us? What's, how, do, how are they positioned in the, er, in the area of lymphoid malignancies? So the study started with a kind of first in human clinical trial that included all B cell malignancies, mainly diffuse large cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. So we started a single agent, you know, LAN for follicular lymphoma, uh, sorry, uh, golcadamide or CC992A2 that we used to call it, golcadamide for follicular large refractory and the LBCL. We saw overall response rate of the kind of the whole group almost like a 50%. So uh, that led to combinations. So the trials actually, I, I'm, I'm happy to um, mention that, you know, we have two oral presentations for volcadamide in relaxed refractory DLBCL for, uh, in, in DLBCL and follicular lymphoma. So you're going to come after Ash and tell me about those. Yeah, of, co of course, of course. I'm presenting the follicular lymphoma actually study. Uh, my colleague uh, uh, from MD Anderson, I think uh, Jason Weston is presenting the diffuse large cell lymphoma cohort. So, um, what we saw was that a single activity, it was, it was very good, and also it was dose dependent. So we, we started with 0 0.2 milligrams, and then it has a thick, like a more, maybe oral response rate of 30%, but we increased to 0, uh, 0 0.4 milligrams, was 50% almost. So in combination, um, you know, in DLBCL, you know, heavily refractory patients, about 40% patients had like a, a even 50% patient had prior CAR T. We saw our response rate of 60% and CR rates of 43%. So if you recall, for instance, the efficacy of bispecific antibodies in Torline uh, DLBCL, it's kind of like around the same. You look at the uh, Grofitamab, it's about 50, 60% over response rate of the CR rates about 39%. So, but I think it's more like a more heavily pretreated patients. So I think uh, uh, it, it, it kind of makes a difference in terms of uh, how we treat these patients in the era that now, you know, for DLBCL and follicular lymphoma, everything is either kind of bispecific, bispecific combinations or CAR cell therapy. This is kind of like an offer another option for patients who don't have access to those right. uh, agents, for instance. In the, in the studies that looked at DLBCL and follicular lymphoma, were some of the patients in these cohorts uh, were patients that have failed cellular therapy? So do we know how cell mods work in patients who have received prior CAR-T maybe and progressed on CAR-T? Oh, yes, yes. So we had um, in the DLDCL cohort, you know, about 50% patients had prior CAR-T. The overall response rate was actually similar. So wow. no difference in terms of responses. And, and let me just kind of back out a little bit, the, uh, a little bit of our preclinical data in, in cell lines and mouse models. So for, you know, you, you, we know that, for instance, for lenalidomide, the um, uh, preferential activity in the LBCL was in non-GCV or ABC subtype, right? So with abadomide, which was kind of like the first cell mode, if I can tell, um, the efficacy was similar in the LBCL in germinal center and ABC. And for golcadomide, we actually see similar efficacy, even if you're a, a high-grade B-cell lymphoma, like a big rearrange or big mutation uh, or even double hit uh, cell lines, mouse models. Um, so, so that's what we, it was, it was a surprise for us that we could see responses also in high risk patients like uh, post-CAR T relapses. That's amazing. So um, are they, are there studies looking at cell mods in combination therapies? Yes. Yes. Um, and even in earlier lines. So we have the gold seek one, which is a, uh, phase three randomized clinical trial comparing, you know, uh, R-CHOP plus golcadomide versus R-CHOP. And I, I, I think they're going to kind of, uh, also there's going to be a trial comparing, uh, you know, polar RCHP, golcadomide versus polar RCHP. There are uh, studies in follicular lymphoma, actually, they call it gold sig 4 I believe that gold sig 4 is the second line, Golka R versus LEN R. And there are plans to frontline even golcadomide, rituximab versus standard of care. So I think these, these agents are moving fast into kind of like earlier lines. Uh, there are a few studies looking at a combination with other agents like tafacitamab, polatuzumab, but uh, the focus is kind of like earlier lines. 
uh, in combination with chemotherapy. And there are actually trials looking at uh, efficacy of uh, like uh, using bridging and maintenance golcalamide in patients receiving CAR T cell therapy because as uh, something I didn't mention, it also has immunomodulatory properties, increased T cell and NK activation. Uh, it, for that reason, it's even like, uh, you know, I've seen studies even in solid tumors. So we have at Moffitt, we had a trial in, in hepatocellular carcinoma too for, with volcalamide. Right. I think it's an agent that has um, great potential for lymphomas and other diseases too. Regulatory approval is, is, it's not, is it approved, not approved? Where does it stand? It's not FDA approved yet. So I, I think not sure if they're looking, they're looking first for follicular lymphoma, if I recall. I don't think they're looking for DLVCL yet, but I guess given the attention that they have so far, the, um, you know, we have, we never had, you know, I did these studies with, you know, emits, um, novel emits or cell months with, uh, with the sponsor for a while. And this is the first time we have oral presentations for two uh, mm-hmm. condition. So I think uh, they will look for something, I hope. What what type of uh, side effects should people watch for? Like what what, uh, what has been reported in terms of adverse events and side effects when using um, cell mods? Yeah, that, that's actually a very good question. So uh, one of the things that you mentioned is preclinically also that is more specific for cerebrum than thalidomide and, and LEN. Um, and in that regard, we don't see what we see usually with LEN, like uh, for instance, rashes or diarrheas or uh, neuropathy or even thrombosis. I mean, as a precaution, we do antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulant therapy for some as physician choice, but we haven't seen that much of those kind of traditional effects of, of emits. But what we see more um, is uh, cytopenia, especially neutropenia. Uh, I think it, it has, because of high potency too, affects some of the transcription factors that kind of leads to better neutrophil count. So the neutroph- neutropenia is, is, is prevalent. It's probably like about 60% of patients have like a grade three neutropenia. And so I, in some as a single have, agent, a single agent. As in the combination, combination. In the combination, you get the neutropenia grade three, but single yeah. agent. Single agent too. Single agent is close to probably 50% of the patients that get uh, neutropenia. So, so we have to kind of uh, mitigate that with growth factors. So, you know, particularly when I was in the trial, uh, I was using growth factors on, the, on all these patients. And so that's kind of like a, the, the main. Um, do, you hold, do, you hold, uh, do you hold the drug and use growth factors or do you just use growth factors and keep going? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, 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 I didn't tell you the schedule, you know, the schedule, the current schedule for uh, combination with rituximab is 14 days on, 14 days off. So what I was doing is, you know, I would give patients, uh, you know, they'll start the 14 days and then I will give uh, um, a DCSF, like uh, right. benfigastrin day one and then just to keep them on. And yeah. that was actually pretty effective. Um mm-hmm. There was also correlation of number of lines of therapies, especially patients who had four or more lines of therapy. They had more likely to have like a severe yeah. neutropenia. Um, so we, we've seen that too. We, unfortunately, because of neutropenia, we've seen infections, you know, including pneumonias, COVID pneumonias, and so on. Uh, that, that has happened under the trial. My last question to you uh, is a year from now, me and you, we're going to talk, of course, before a year from now. But a year from now, if I have you on the podcast, which we will, where do you think we will be talking about cell mods? Where do you think 12 months from now cell mods in lymphoid malignancies will be? I think, uh, well, I, I hope that the goal C1, which is the ARCHOP, Golcadamide versus ARCHOP, will be completed. You know, it, it was almost like... A, 80% enroll, complete en- completion of enrollment. So it probably will be completed. Maybe in a year, may have some preliminary data of at least overall response rate of the gold seek, I hope. Um, but no kind of like uh, outcome the efficacy yet is kind of early. Uh, we may see some of the initial uh, combination in earlier lines with follicular lymphoma. The goal, the gold seek four is, is looking at frontline follicular lymphoma as a single agent. In, in combination with rituximab. So that may, may actually kind of like uh, be uh, most of the impact, the most impactful presentations in a year or so. 
Julio, thank you so much. This was so helpful. It's like a quick, uh, a quick uh, synopsis on what's happening in Selmides and lymphoid malignancies. And I look forward to uh, seeing you in Chicago at the second annual hematology think tank. No, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm be, I was very happy and glad to be in the podcast. I, I watch your, your podcast all the time. I think it's, um, uh, the topics are very interesting to me. So thank you for having me. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Healthcare Unfiltered Express. Until next time, take care.